Solving Punnett squares, the secrets to solving any problem. Things to remember, Punnett squares are used to figure possible genotypes and phenotypes of offspring. Genes don't always work the same way. There are different modes of or par patterns of inheritance. Use the mnemonic MGAPS PO. Before continuing, here are a couple terms. Genotype versus phenotype. The genotype is the allele combination of an organism, also the letter combination. And phenotype is a physical appearance of an organism. Genes are sections of DNA that contain um, instructions to build a protein that will reveal our traits. And then remember that alleles are the different forms of a gene. So if the gene is eye color, um, there are the alleles brown eyes and green eyes. So heterozygous down here is when alleles for the same trait are different. Big R, little R, big T, little T, big G, little G. In other words, you have a capital and a lowercase, dominant and recessive. Um, but when they're both the same, uh, like both lowercase or both uppercase, then those are called homozygous. They're the same size or the same type. Then you have purebred versus hybrid. Purebred is just the same thing as homozygous. Hybrid is heterozygous. Dominant means the trait that, or the allele that overpowers and is dominant. It, it stands out, it hides the recessive, and like you can see here the little cat in the jar, the recessive one is the one that's being hidden. It's actually there, but not appearing. It's not dominant. Can we predict what your children will look like in the future? Kind of. Um, at least we know the possible chances of a certain trait appearing. So why do we use Punnett squares? Well, we, we do use them to predict the possible genotypes and phenotypes of offspring. Chances of a certain trait or disease uh, appearing. Um, so maybe it's used for medical and family use um, to explain how traits are passed down. And we get percentages, ratios, or fractions. Remember that Punnett squares don't tell you how many kids you're going to have. This doesn't say you're going to have four kids. It doesn't say your first one's going to have a certain disease or the second one's going to have this or that. All it is is gives you a percentage of the chances, the likelihood, also called the probability, that a child will be born with something. MGAPS PO, here's a way to remember it. The mode of inheritance, genes, alleles, parents, sex cells, punnet squares, and offspring. A good way to remember it is my great aunt Patty sold pizzas online. Okay, so M is mode of inheritance. Um, there's three forms you're going to see on the CST. One is called autosomal dominance. This is what we've been used to. It's called the complete or classical dominance type. And that's when just genes work by being dominant or recessive. And you remember that, and it's very simple. We just use letters like big P, little P, cross with big P, little P. I mean, this is a form we've been used to, and then the dominant will overpower. And again, why do they call it, why do they call it autosomal dominance? They're trying to confuse us, right? No, well, it just means that the autosomes are the first chromosomes, 1 through 22. The sex chromosomes are the last pair, 23. And autosomes are focused on the other ones, which are pretty much homologous chromosomes. So what that means is that it can, it can equally be found in male and female, and that's what's shown by this diagram. Equal chance to appear in males and females. But then when we talk about sex-linked, this is different now. Remember sex-linked, um, we have an X and Y chromosome, and the X has more information, as you can see right here. It has more genes. And so a lot of diseases will be carried here. Um, and remember, the, the thing is that in males, the you know, the since they don't have another X chromosome, they just have one X. If that one X they get from their mom it has a disease on it, then they will have the disease. It's not like females who have two X chromosomes, and they get the protection here. Just like in this example, she's protected with the dominant form, but the boy won't have that protection. He'll have the disease. So whenever we do sex link traits, we always write them in this form. Don't forget that. We always put X and then a subscript or a superscript. And, and that'll indicate how we're, we're going to show how those traits are being passed down. So that's how we do those. And then incomplete dominance is when the traits blend. So the first one is genes. How many genes? Um, use the letter Qs in the problem to figure out how many. If you see one letter, for example, they're talking about big E, little e. Well, that's one letter. They're talking about E. So that means it's one gene. Um, when they're talking about two letters, for example, E and F, um, they're talking about two genes. And you're going to see with four alleles. Um, you can use trait information. Maybe just keep reading. And then if you hear them talk about one thing, like eye color, and that's it, then that's one gene. And they'll usually give you the alleles. Sometimes they're talking about eye color and height or something else. And so then that's two genes. 
And when we're talking about one gene, we're going to use a monohybrid cross. That means there's one gene, there's two alleles, and we're going to use the one with four boxes. If it's dihybrid, that means there's two genes, four alleles, and we're going to use the one with the dihybrid with 16 boxes. The first thing we do is, um, or the second thing we do, A, is we find the alleles. Which one is dominant, which one's recessive? So you're going to find one that's the, the capital and one that's the lowercase. So designate your alleles. And then we figure out what the parent genotypes are. And this you could just figure out by reading the problem. It'll say, for example, what are the possible offspring from a heterozygous tall cross with a short parent? And based on that information, you could figure out the genotypes of the parents. For example, the heterozygous tall would be big T, little t, and short would be little t, little t. Then the next step, it would be to figure out the sex cell genotypes. And remember, if there's one gene, all you have to do is separate. If there's two genes, then you do FOIL to figure out the sex cell. It's only one gene here. How do I know that? Because they only have one letter, T, that we're dealing with. So we're going to just se separate, again, the loss segregation. There you go. And those are the sex cells. And then Punnett square. And that means you set up your Punnett square. You put the sperm on the top and the eggs on the side. And I'm just going to carry these in here. I'm going to carry the eggs down here. And then the next step is figure out the offspring by fertilizing them. Okay, so then we, are, we know how this goes. We go uh, across and down. Across and down. Notice that I'm putting the capital one in front. Across and down. So big, little t, little t. And then little t, little t. And then we can figure out um, what the offspring are. Then we check for understanding. So right now, pause the video and put these in order. All right, here are the answers. And this is what you want to put in your worksheet. Pause it and copy it down in your worksheet. Moving on now. Here's a sample problem. Fill it in your notes. Let's read it together and you're going to write it down exactly where it says write the question. Huntington's disease is an autosomal dominant disorder passed down through families in which certain nerve cells in the brain waste away or degenerate. What is a probable offspring from a male who is a heterozygous for the disease and a female who does not have the disease? So you want to pause it right now and copy that down. So moving on, what do we do first? Well, we figure out the mode of inheritance. It's autosomal dominant. How do I know that? Well, they told us that. Even if they didn't tell us that, um, it's usually just autosomal. And you can figure out if the trait is dominant or recessive by reading on. Um, how many genes? Well, it's one gene. I know that because we're just talking about Huntington's disease. We're not talking about height and eye color. And we're only talking about one thing, which is Huntington's disease. So I'm going to use a monohybrid cross with four boxes. Again, there's one gene, two alleles, and the one with four boxes. So what are the alleles? Well, they told us that the disease is dominant. So I'm going to choose big H to be the allele for Huntington's disease because it's dominant, capital. And little h is going to be healthy, not having the disease. And then we figure out who the parents are. And if we read it carefully, they said that the male is heterozygous for the disease. And that the female has, does not have the disease. So heterozygous for the disease, meaning one capital, one lowercase, remember? So we're going to put big H, little h. And the female, the mom, doesn't have the disease. So the only way that could ha be possible is if there's two little H's, right? Um, in case you forgot, if we have a big H here, then the big H overpowers because it's dominant, and then it would have the disease. So the only form has to be two little H's. And then we figure out the sex cells. There's only one gene here because we're just talking about the letter H, and therefore we're going to separate, and that's it. So let's get the sperm cells here. Let's get the genotypes for the egg cells. Now we have the sex cells. The next step after that is we figure out the Punnett square. That's what P stands for. So let's go ahead and put the sperm right there. Let's put the eggs over here. And now the last step is to fin figure out your offspring by fertilizing. Again, down and across, down and across, down and across, and down and across. Remember the capital goes in front. And then when we do this, we figure out Okay, what are these offspring? 
Well, they have big H in front. Big H, I know, is dominant. What did big H stand for? Oh, Huntington's disease. So these two out of four, that's one half or 50% have the disease. How about these, little H, little H? Oh, those are healthy, so 50-50. Sample two. Again, copy the question down in your worksheet. Sickle cell anemia is an autosomal recessive disorder that leads to sickle-shaped red blood cells that block blood flow and do not carry oxygen very well. What are the probable offspring from a cross between a carrier female and a carrier male? Again, pause the video and copy that question down. Continuing on now. Well, we know it's autosomal recessive because they told us right there. Um, if they didn't say anything, we would know it's autosomal. And to figure out recessive or dominant, you would just keep reading. We know it's one gene because we're talking about sickle cell anemia and nothing else. So we know it has two alleles, monohybrid, and four boxes again. So what are the alleles? Well, sickle cell is recessive. So whatever I have to designate sickle cell to be on the lowercase letter, whichever letter I choose. doesn't matter what letter I choose, just I have to put sickle cell on the lowercase letter. This time I used N. I don't know why, but just chose it. I guess N I meant to say normal, but healthy. And again, little n is sickle cell anemia because it's recessive. They told us the disease is recessive. Now, we go with the parents, and here they said that the parents are, uh, the male is a carrier, and the female is also a carrier. So to be a carrier means that you don't have the sickness. Um, you're not sick, but you're carrying it, so you're hiding it. And so the only way for that to be possible is to be heterozygous. So big N, little n, big N, little n. Again, I then find the sex cells. It's one gene because there's just the letter N, one letter. So I go ahead and segregate. And then they also said um, we have to go ahead and make the Punnett square, set it up. So I put the sperm there. I put the eggs down there. Then I fill out the offspring. Again, by fertilizing sperm and egg down and across, down and across, down and across down and across. And by looking at this, it looks like these have the dominant in front, therefore it's healthy. So three out of four are healthy, and one out of four has sickle cell anemia. Sample three, write this one in your notes. Color blindness is a sex-linked disorder where one, where one cannot distinguish certain colors from others. What is the probability that a colorblind female is born from a female carrier and a non-affected male? Again, we look this time. This time they tell us right away it's sex-linked disorder. So it's sex-linked and um, it's recessive because color blindness or most, most, um, most sex-linked disorders are recessive. It's one gene, two alleles, and monohybrid, four boxes because we're only talking about color blindness. Um, big C is healthy, little c is colorblind because little c is recessive. The color blindness recessive. We figure out the parents, and here they said that the male is not affected, the female is a carrier. So for the guy to be not affected, well, we know we have to use X's now. It's not autosomal anymore. It's not where we just put letters. We we have to put the X's or designate the sex chromosomes because it is sex linked. We know guys are X Y, and we only put stuff above the X because it's X linked. And so we put big C because they said the guy is not affected. So he's healthy. So big C, Y. And the female, which is XX, she's a carrier. So that means she must have a big C and a little C. And then we go ahead and make the sex cells. And again, there's only one, one gene we're talking about. We're talking about color blindness. So we just separate. Separate. Then we figure out the putted square. Set it up. Again, put the sperm there. Put the eggs over here. And then we go ahead and fertilize to get the offspring. And again, that's how we do sex link traits. Notice it's different. We use X's and Y's or X's and X's for with the uh, superscript. That's for sex link traits. And then we could go ahead and look at this. And what we find are that 0% are colorblind. They want to know if there's a colorblind female. And I look at the females. Only look at the females here when they ask these types of questions. Or... In this case, they're asking how many are colorblind females. So I look at the females. Both of these, these are healthy. Or this child is healthy, sorry. And this child is a carrier. 
and but she's healthy so they want to know how many girls are colorblind none of them are colorblind and then sample four there are three possible genotypes and phenotypes for wing color in a species of moth big r big r is red wings big r little r is orange wings little r little r is yellow wings what are the probable offspring in a cross between an orange male moth and a yellow female moth well, the mode of inheritance is incomplete dominance. How do I know that? It's because when the heterozygous form is a mix between the dominant and the recessive forms, it's a blend, there's three phenotypes now, and the middle one is a, is a mix. It's a mix of red and yellow. So whenever traits are mixing in this sort of way, it's called incomplete dominance. There's still one gene. We're talking about wing color and nothing else. So still two alleles, monohybrid, four boxes. I set it up. I know the alleles, big R is red little r is yellow but in the heterozygous form big r little r gives you orange because red and yellow blend then i figure out the parents again who's crossing well we look at the problem and it says that the male is um, orange and the female is is uh, yellow so male orange means um big r little r right and then yellow means little r little r so we're going to cross those go ahead and segregate Go ahead, put the sex cells down there, and then fertilize down and across, down and across, down and across, down and across. It looks like we get 50% orange, 50% yellow. This is for advanced students. If you feel you're advanced, you want to go for a, a dye hybrid. How many genotypes are possible in the offspring of a cross between big A, little A, big B, little B, cross with big A, little A? Big B, li uh, little B, little B. So what do you do here? Well, we know it's autosomal because they're not saying it's sex linked. And anytime they don't tell you anything of what it is, just figure it's autosomal. Straightforward. Um, we know it's two genes. How do I know? Because there's two letters. Big A, or sorry, just the A and then B. A and B are used, so two genes now. Four alleles. Dihybrid, 16 boxes. The alleles, again, are big A, little A, big B, little B. And then we figure out the parents. So they already gave us the parents in the problem. And, and that was already stated there. That's easy. And then this time, because there's two genes, we don't just segregate. We have to do FOIL because of the law of independent assortment. So we go ahead. We know how to do that. Big A, big B, big A, little B, little A, big B, little A, little B. Do FOIL over here for these, uh, this parent. Now we have sperm and egg. Put the sperm along here. Put the eggs along here. And then go ahead and fill it out. This time keep all the A's on the left side and the B's on the right side because of alphabetical order. And then you go ahead and fill out the Punnett square. And pause the video if you want to see some of the steps. I'm just going quickly because of time. And then we go to see how many genotypes there are. Well, that's one type of genotype. Here's another kind. That's another kind. That's another kind. That's another kind. And that's another kind. Notice I didn't circle these because these are similar to that one. These are similar to these. So in reality, there's only six different genotypes. 